Hi Cornerstone, let's try it again. This is Mike Gillen, pastor at Cornerstone United Methodist Church. This is this is my second attempt at our Wednesday worship Bible study. Hopefully you can hear me now. Made an adjustment looking for staff to text me and say, yeah, we can hear you this time. Or we still can't hear you. So this study is uh, good. You can hear me now. All right, great. Hi, Katie. Hi, Kim. Good. Good to see you all today, uh, virtually speaking. So this is our virtual ministries for Cornerstone United Methodist Church focused on our Wednesday worship. Appreciate Karina McGlasson's uh, worship music that she brought to us. I have a sound coordinator who can't hear me, but other people say they can hear me. So I'm trusting you all who are out there in the world that you can hear me well. Um, hopefully the sound is all right. Um, I'll adjust the technicalities of sound first before we get to the actual study itself. All right. So, looks like the sound is all squared away. Great to be able to be with you today. The scripture I'm going to look at in just a minute is from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Good to see you, Chris. Hi, Susie. Our Sue. Hi, Kate, Katie. Hi, Kim. Hi, Tom. Uh, glad you're with me uh, this evening for this study in First Peter. So the reason I wanted to use this scripture tonight is because it seems to me we're in a time where we face a lot of difficulty and wanted to find some kind of practical way for us to think about how to take the Bible and apply it to our real life, our everyday life. And so my intention is for us to see these words in First Peter as something that can help us. The writer of uh, this letter to a church 2,000 years ago is uh, the Apostle Peter, who's tr trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to um, help the people of, of the early church were scattered throughout the Mediterranean and facing a lot of difficulty, trying to give them hope. So 1 Peter chapter 1 starts in verse, in verse 2 with these words, May grace and peace be yours in abundance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we've given, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you've had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you may not have seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in Jesus and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So what I want to talk about today is uh, just how during the difficult times we're facing, that the scripture can be something that can be part of our everyday life. That we can take some of the words and we can recite them in our mind, that we can see different ideas in the scripture as being something to be part of how we live every day and that we change the way we think about the situation we're in and that we frame our lives with a vision for a much longer term than just today or yesterday or tomorrow. But we have a kind of eternal look into the everyday life we live. So again, starting in uh, the very first, uh, actually the second verse in First Peter 1, it says, may grace and peace uh, be yours. And that's what I hope uh, you'll, you'll take from this scripture, that you'll look at that scripture throughout the week. And in 1 Peter 
one, end of verse two, that you think about how grace and peace can be yours every day. Maybe you need to find a way to have God's grace, God's peace enter into your life. Maybe you're like our kids and you need to get out for a little bit and go outside and do some yard work. Or uh, maybe you need to uh, do some exercise. One of our kids likes to longboard and he goes out every day to just get out into the uh, out of the house for a bit. Maybe you just need to sit and uh, find a moment of peace for yourself. The scripture is encouraging us to do something, to participate in the grace and peace God wants to give to us. Well, then the author of the letter of 1 Peter goes on to say, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In this verse, the author gives us a kind of formula for how to pray. We begin by uh, praising God and thanking God for what God has done. We claim a kind of faith in the truth of Easter, that Jesus didn't remain dead, but is raised to new life. And in that hope, we begin to see that the God who raised Jesus from death is with us today. The idea is God's very imminent and real, very much a part of our life every day. And so the scripture is encouraging us to calm down, to receive a truth, even in the midst of real difficulty. The people Peter was writing to very, very likely needed some kind of reminder, some kind of encouragement that the tough times they were facing wasn't a total separation from God, but that God was with them in the midst of the difficulty that they were facing. The author of 1 Peter goes on to say that through this resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's an inheritance that's been gained that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. I think about uh, the notion of inheritance and the intention of our, our faith and of someone who is a follower of Christ to have a sincere faith in God that leads to a perception there is something we get to inherit for being part of this family of God. The inheritance can be something that's experienced in this world, even as it's a hope for future beyond this world. So the inheritance of eternal life is something that's guiding us to see how we can live better every day. It's meant to shape our understanding of who we are and of how we should behave. It's meant to change the way we understand the very identity we have, rather than thinking about ourselves in terms of where we live, where we've come from, in terms of ethnicity or neighborhood background, what language we speak, or what uh, our favorite sports teams might be. Whatever those particular persuasions that connect us to our identity, First Peter is suggesting to us that the overarching identity we have first as followers of Christ is that we're citizens of eternity, that this heavenly citizenship, which is a promised inheritance in life beyond this life, is at the same time meant to shape how we live every day. That as we think about the promise of this eternal salvation, we see that as the scripture goes on to say, we understand that we're being protected by the power of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The suggestion is that our faith is placed in the right place, that our faith is placed in God who can be trusted because God has sh been shown to be faithful and that Christ's resurrection is evidence of that faith, that trust, that power. That leads us then to understand how to live every day. It says again in verse 6, in, in this you rejoice, meaning the inheritance of eternal life, even if now for a little while you have to suffer various trials. The reason for this letter is, among other things, that the writer of this letter is trying to encourage people during a really difficult time in their life. It's the, the circumstances that are leading to the words being spoken today. I know that like you, I know like me, you and I have both experienced difficulties during this time, that there are a lot of things that can be trials of faith, tests of patience, even frustrations with other people as others 
that we see on TV or even in our community struggle with the pandemic we're facing today. The scripture for this evening is suggesting to us that God's not unaware of the trials we're facing, just like 2,000 years ago. The scripture speaks to those first hearers and readers of this letter, and it, it speaks to all of us to say that God sees the difficulty we're going through and encourages us to understand these as temporary trials. Verse 7 says that that as we grow through these trials, or as we find God walking with us during these trials, it helps us to verify the genuineness of our faith, which, like gold, can be tested, but is worth more than gold, even though it's a, a purified kind of precious, precious uh, metal. The scripture goes on to say that we may be found to our faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It helps us to see that there is a kind of expectation that when we get through the difficulties and move on to life beyond this life, we see a kind of time of promised celebration. But that celebration doesn't have to wait until eternity. Verse 8 goes on to say, Although you haven't seen Christ, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Here the scripture is encouraging us to, in worship and in prayer, spend time celebrating God with us and the God who promises us life, even beyond this life. And so we're encouraged to see how God's with us, helping us in the difficulty. God's walking with us when we celebrate and that there is a kind of joy that God wants to give to us. Verse 9 says, uh, For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And it's implied that that's because of the things they're experiencing, the community they found in each other as Christians pray together, worship together, and live life together, overcoming difficulties, celebrating the good times, and, and finding that their faith is real in them and real in others and leading them to purposes that are really changing not only their lives, but the lives of others around them. This is a kind of joy that's being spoken of that encourages them to see that they should act in very, uh, in terms of faith terms, childlike ways, rejoicing with joy, finding joy in the different moments of life that, uh, that are all around them. You probably can't hear it, but right now while I'm talking to you, right outside the window to my left, there are three little boys playing on big wheels and tricycles in the cul-de-sac outside our house. They're all less than six years old. Little boys, brothers, having a great time, yelling and screaming and having a lot of fun. In many ways, they are completely unaware of all the worries that so many of us have right now. Every once in a while, when I feel a little frustrated, I can count on those neighbor boys to be out there having a great time. It reminds me that there can be times of joy, there can be celebration, even in the most frustrating and scary times. I hope that the scripture, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, can be something you go back to during this week and in the weeks to come, that you find in these words some inspiration that leads you to hopefulness in the days that you are facing now and the days you'll face in the, the not too distant future. Today, I know that we've heard some good things from um, people in elected office who give us guidelines for how to live life. Hope that in the not too distant future, we'll be able to move towards a little bit of normalcy, a little bit less confinement in our homes. I want to encourage you for now to continue to be safe, to stay safe by staying at home, to understand that stay at home guidelines are keeping you well. I am convinced that this is a crucial thing for us to do. Cornerstones developed ministries, both virtual ministries and ministries through our, a phone tree in order to stay connected to one another to encourage one another in prayer and just in friendship, 
but also to remind us that we don't have to be in a physical building to be the church. So I hope you'll continue to see that you being at home is not only keeping you safe, but keeping friends and family and neighbors safe as well. I believe that it's important for us to do. At Cornerstone, we'll continue to evaluate where we are in terms of the next steps of ministry. And at the end of this month, we'll talk about what our next steps will be as a church. But my intention is for us to continue to do no harm so that we'll be able to do good for Jesus Christ by staying well and not infecting other people, believing that we should continue to grow in love with God day by day as we continue to find ways to worship God, pray both on our own and with our families and with others, studying scripture, and finding ways to serve one another in a, in a kind of very faithful expression of our our love for Christ. I hope that um, this week, as you spend time in prayer, you'll consider every day at noon to take a moment and silently or with others you're with uh, in your home, uh, say a prayer. I'm encouraging everyone at Cornerstone to find at the noon hour, just a moment where everyone who's part of Cornerstone or Cornerstone's virtual ministries to Take time to pray. I want to give you a prayer concern that you can remember tonight and each day that you're in, in prayer, whether it's at the noon hour and or other times. So one of our church members, Ron, has a co-worker named Calvin. Calvin and his daughter, Leah, and Calvin's wife, Lita, and their family have been in our prayers as a church for a few weeks now. Leah is a nurse who was taking care of COVID patients. The end of last week, she developed COVID-19. This week, her mom and dad, Calvin, the co-worker of Ron, and Lita, the mom, have all developed, and everyone else in the family has developed COVID-19 symptoms. And uh, yesterday, Lita was admitted into the hospital. So I hope we'll be praying for Calvin and Lita and Leah and their family. They all live in the same home together. Uh, Leah has children who live there. The interesting thing that I didn't know uh, until just a day ago, maybe two days ago, is that this family lives within the neighborhood I'm in right now. They're less than a, a half mile away from where I'm actually sitting. So I know that the, there are people in my community, the specific neighborhood I'm in, in St. Charles County, in O'Fallon, where Cornerstone is, there are people who are facing this virus and struggling for health. And so I um, hope you'll be praying for Calvin, Lita, and Leah, and their family, and those that you might know that are also uh, fighting to stay healthy. I also want you to remember Lynn. She's one of the friends of our family who's a respiratory therapist in one of the local hospitals here. She's been working in that hospital for many years, and I know that for her, um, she's got long 12-hour days and lots and lots to do. And so she represents all those uh, who are in uh, health care right now on the front lines with this battle. It's been great to be with you this evening. Let me offer a prayer to conclude our time. Pray together. God, thank you for the way you bring us together. I pray that you'd continue to take care of those that we're concerned about. Be with those who are facing illness and dealing with the uh, health care of those who have this virus, we pray for their well-being. Pray for everyone who's part of this ministry tonight that you give to everyone uh, that's watching this Bible study a sense of peace and purpose and hope. In Christ's name, amen. Great to see you tonight. Have a good week. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday for Cornerstone Virtual Sunday.